I'll sum it up. There was a gentleman named uh, Ernest Raymond Beaumont Gant. He was a Cajun Texan, grew up in the Houston area. His grandfather was a Texas oil billionaire. And when Ernest uh, came of age in the 1920s, his grandfather gave him a choice. He said, I got a lot of money. I will pay for your college education, or I'll take that same money and give it to you, and you can travel around the world. <laughs> Ernest, being a smart young man, <laughs> opted to travel around the world. Ernest, being really smart, this was in the 1920s, when you could not get a drink in the United States of America. Yeah. So he left the port of New Orleans and uh, directly headed into the Caribbean, where he uh, dragged himself throughout the, the Caribbean islands, and he learned very handily that he had a great palate for rum and discerning flavors in the various rums. Uh, if uh, those of many of you have probably had all sorts of different rums from various Caribbean countries, or South American countries, or Mesoamerican countries. Uh, maybe you've even been to those countries and sampled them uh, at their distilleries. But it doesn't matter, you all know that it's all about terroir. Sugar cane grows out of the ground. And the flavors that come out of individual rums come from that soil. And there's a lot of volcanic islands, there's a lot of flat islands, there's mountainous, there's all sorts of uh, types of, uh, what's that word I want, the, about the, like, the geography? Uh, terrain, yeah, there's different terrain down there. and. Uh, Sometimes there's a lot of rain, sometimes there's a lot of rain that floods everything. But basically, the idea was that Don, or Ernest, as he was still known then, learned a lot about different types of rums. He then went through the uh, recently built Panama Canal and went over to the South Pacific, where he continued to uh, study different types of uh, spirits over there. They did not really have a rum culture, per se, but, uh, but they did have a culture of combining different types of fruit juices, especially in the Philippines. The Filipinos were the really masters of taking all different types of fruit juices and combining them into one specific drink. Don, who had you know, already figured out that he liked to drink, thought, hmm, if I put a little rum in this, maybe I can get a little kick from it. Maybe if I put a couple of different rums in it, and some of these various syrups that he had learned about in, in uh, his travels, that, uh, you know, the, the French made a, an almond syrup called the Orgiat, which you could get in places like Martinique and Guadeloupe. The uh, British made a syrup called Falernum, which is lime, clove, cinnamon syrup, which uh, awesome basically comes stuff. from the island of Trinidad and, uh, and Barbados. Uh, and also in British Guiana, that's where uh, babies get that. It's, it's a very small amount of alcohol in it, so that they give them that for a tea thing. I think my tooth is loose. I'm not able to it. <laughs> so, is there a dentist? what happened was uh, Ernest uh, washed ashore in Los Angeles, California around uh, 1930, so Prohibition was still going on. But he, uh, when he showed up, he had gathered all sorts of flotsam and jetsam from all these different countries. And uh, when he washed ashore in, uh, in Los Angeles, he had all this stuff, and he uh, got himself into a position where he was able to rent a lot of this stuff out to, to movie studios who were making these sort of like sons of the tropics and uh, you know, sons of the desert type of, of thing, things at the time, and uh, he was able to rent a lot of this stuff, which was his introduction into a lot of the folks that were in the Hollywood community. At the same time, he was working as a dishwasher in a Chinese restaurant in Chinatown in L.A., and uh, eventually came up with the idea of opening his own place, which he did about two weeks after Prohibition ended. Smart guy. Actually, Prohibition ended in just December 5th of 1933. So he opened in the second week of January. Because he had to the lease. But he opened his place, and it was called Don the Beachcomber. And it was a hugely successful place right off the bat, even though it only had about 12 seats. Of course, that added to the allure. But it became a big hangout for Hollywood stars. Uh, Cary Grant was a friend of uh, Don, as he had renamed himself. 
Donald Beachcomber, and uh, brought in all sorts of the folks like Joan Crawford was a, a big uh, early hanger on there, hanging out, and uh, Cary Grant, and as I said, and uh, Spencer, yeah, Spencer Tracy, Clark Gable, people like that, he used to hang out, and uh, eventually, of course, it became, the line was too long, so he got a bigger place, also in Hollywood, and this is, you know, central Hollywood, around Hollywood and Vine, and so, that area, and he opened a second place, which was a lot larger, and it kind of took off from there. So, he had taken all this knowledge that he had learned in his travels, and got a bunch of Filipino bartenders, about eight of them actually, they would all have, they, nobody ever made one specific drink, it was a, an assembly line, because these drinks had so many different things inside them. He would, uh, one person would pour the liquor, one person might pour the syrup, one might, one might do the fruit juice and, and maintain, keep, keep squeezing the juice and stuff like that during the night, and uh, sending these drinks out. It took off, 1934, uh, a few years later, uh, Victor Bergeron, who had a place called Pinky Dinks up in Oakland, California, uh, which was a barbecue place. He came down and saw what was going on down there, and he said, oh, this guy's making a hell of a lot of money. I can do this in San Francisco as well. And he opened, he changed his name to Trader Vic and opened that in the late 1930s, well, 1937, I believe. And uh, that took off from there, and uh, by the mid-1940s, uh, especially after the Second World War ended with a lot of uh, people who were in the military coming back from the South Pacific uh, would go to these places and have all these drinks and this sort of glorified Chinese food that Don had learned about in working in a Chinese restaurant uh, where they just sort of made it a little more like Polynesian, made it exotic. Nobody really knew uh, as far as non-Asians that would go to these places. Oh, it's from Polynesia, okay. Yeah, actually it wasn't even really from China, it was from Los Angeles or San Francisco. But that's another story. But uh, that's where Tiki started and uh, got to uh, you know where we are today. Uh, I'll just tell you personally, my personal story on it is in 1973, I, uh, as many of you know, I, I have played in bands for like, my entire life. And I was playing in a band that played a prom at the Kowloon up in Saugus. <laughs> and at the end of the show, uh, the Wong family, who uh, have run that place beautifully for since like 1947, uh, they said, oh, you can come downstairs and we'll put a table up for the band. Everybody can eat and we'll, then they start bringing out scorpion bowls. Now, I was not old enough to drink. <laughs> They didn't really check that stuff that back then. <laughs> the other people in the band, the other guys in the band, actually all were over 21, so they just kind of figured, who cares? But I had my first scorpion ball at age 17. And, oh, uh, no, I sh with the with the other four guys in the okay. in the band. Oh, the, you know, there was one, and then there was another. It might have been three. I was able to drive back to Memphis. It was okay. Fly. And our logo was the, the Y was a zipper opening. And, and, <laughs> hey, it was the 70s, what can I tell you? <laughs> my, my past, it returns to haunt me once again. But, uh, so the Kowloon, I had that, and that, was, that completely changed my orbit. And uh, I got obsessed with uh, Polynesian style drinks, tiki drinks as you will. And uh, in the 90s, I met a fellow out in Los Angeles, uh, Jeff Berry, who was a writer, uh, a, a script doctor in Hollywood and a director at Disney. And uh, he wrote a, a thing called the Beach Bum Berry's Grog Log back in 1994, which actually had the recipes of these places, of the, of the different drinks, because nobody knew what was really in them. I used to go to a place in Davis Square, it was called Ye Village. And I was convinced that the name of that place was because they had the blender, and you know the trick with tiki drinks with a blender, you only want to have it go, go for like three seconds. So every two minutes or so, you get. Ee, ee, ee. <laughs> well, that's it. That's why this is Ye Village. That's the blender <laughs> making these drinks. But uh, Jeff uh, has written a whole bunch of uh, books 
since that time on TV. And I would just like to implore everyone, if you have not read this book, Beach Bumberry's Potions of the Caribbean, uh, this came out a few months ago. This is the, if you're interested in this stuff and want to see where this came from and also get an amazing array of incredible, incredible drink recipes. This goes back to where the whole tiki thing really starts, but it's, it's in Cuba, essentially. And it's, as Jeff calls it, the Holy Trinity, rum, sugar, lime. And that's really what everything here is, is based on. And uh, that's our tiki history. Anybody's got any questions? We'll be having drinks outside later. Or you can just read Jeff's book and, uh, and we'll talk about Jeff. I will just say he just opened what may be the best tiki bar in America. Now he opened it in New Orleans uh, just a couple of months ago, and uh, it's called Latitude 29. It's in the French Quarter. It's in the uh, Bienville Hotel. I just uh, had my birthday there three weeks ago. I turned 60, so he brought me a 60-ounce drink. Thanks, Jeff. <laughs> Hope I see 61, huh? He's like, yeah, we'll get rid of the riffraff here, huh? But uh, if you find yourself in the Crescent City, I highly recommend that you uh, check this place out. But let's talk about uh, this, this drink quickly so we can get on to the next one. Because I know... I see a lot of empty bottles around here. <laughs> so carbonating drinks is, as I had said earlier, Jeffrey Morgenthaler in Portland, Oregon, did this. And a lot of people have done it uh, since then. The one thing, if you want to try this at home, well, you know, it's a little heavy, but it works. <laughs> but I will just say this. Do not ever use a soda stream. Okay? <laughs> you might be able to do it, but there's there's probably like a 60-40 chance that it will blow up and blow your face off. <laughs> I'm not the type of alarmist person, you know, that sees chicken, you know, fall, what is it, uh, the sky is falling. I don't see that behind every, I've lived too long. But, <laughs> I'm not going to blow my own goddamn face off for a goddamn <laughs> sparkling drink. <laughs> this is, you can get smaller tanks on this, but this is, it's actually, I mean, you can, you can carbonate anything with this. <laughs> the mind boggles. The trick, though, is if you ever want a carbonated drink, it has to be really, really cold. What we did here the other day was we, I batched this drink. We did this on Saturday. Uh, but we batched it and uh, we took dry ice and packed up uh, speed pours, plastic speed pours, and floated them in it and put it in the walk-in. So in about a half an hour, we got it actually to a pretty good temperature. Uh, if you have like liquid uh, liquid nitrogen, you can use that. But uh, I know everybody keeps that around the house, and I think you need some sort of license from the. Uh... No. Oh, oh, oh. Did you bring some for everyone? Ah, uh, yeah. But essentially, to to do this type of thing, if you uh, obviously if you own a bar, you, this is a lot more. Uh, or work in a bar, and you want to tell your boss, hey, this is a good way to do this. Uh, it's actually fairly inexpensive. This entire rig uh, will cost you about $150 to get rolling, and then afterwards you just get refills on the CO2 itself, which is a lot less money. You uh, do get refills. Uh, this is a deposit on a tank. It's a little more of a deposit than on an empty beer bottle, but uh, it's still pretty good. But you need a... Uh, get this up. The first thing you need is a regulator. That's this thing here, which uh, keeps the PSI in, in check, which is why you can't really use one of those um, uh, soda strings, because the, the carbon just comes out at, at whatever rate you want. This way you can regulate it. We keep it at 40 PSI to, to do this. So that keeps it from blowing up. Essentially, you take this hose, This is going to blow up, isn't it? Look at this up. So the hose, you buy the hose and the clamps, and then uh, this is uh, this keeps it from getting, it's a safety valve, actually. 
And this is what they call the carbonator. What you do is you take like a, a two liter bottle of uh, empty bottle, like a, say a Pepsi or something like that. Actually, you can use any size, but if you're going to carbonate a lot of stuff, you want to use two liters. You just put this, this has a screw top, this screws onto the top of your empty plastic bottle, and you fill that up almost all the way, but you leave about three inches empty on the top for the gas to fill. You put your beverage in there, and then you just take this and put that on, put the gas on for about 10 seconds or so, and shake like a bastard, <laughs> as we would say in West Metric. But uh, that, will that actually makes the carbonation happen. And then what we did was we just funneled these into uh, these bottles, these little champagne, they call these champagne bottles, which we uh, got at a homebrew store. Uh, it was uh, 25 bucks for 25 of them. And uh, don't cap it, and just cap it. And then uh, you're, you're good to go. So that's, uh, that's how you carbonate a, uh, a drink. And you can essentially, if it has fruit juice in it, uh, Chef, uh, you seen Jamie around? I need to get uh, number two. Yeah. yeah. We need drinks. I just want to make sure you all stay refreshed. Get yeah. <laughs> these drinks out of the, in the right order here. Bravo. Uh, yeah, so uh, you can use that with a smaller tank. You, know, you can get little tanks. And, there you go. Uh, right get on them rolling that way. And it's a lot of fun because you can do, you can, like I was saying earlier, you can essentially carbonate anything. You can buy some cheap wine and pass it off as champagne. <laughs> well, Classy. <laughs> All right, so uh, we will continue on here. Let me just refresh myself.